What promises to be a most extraordinary conversation we are all privileged to have with Ms. Gillian Tett, the U.S. Managing Editor and Assistant Editor of the Financial Times. Uh, Ms. Tett, we're really delighted to have you here. Um, and I know it was difficult for you to get away from your, from your desk in the midst of all the events that are occurring in both the U.S. and in Europe uh, as we speak. And we're looking forward to hearing your perspectives on those uh, in the evening. Uh, the turnout tonight is not only a sign of the extraordinary interest in hearing about the global economy in Europe in particular from somebody as knowledgeable uh, as Ms. Tet. It is also a recognition of the, of the role that this series that the Chicago Council has been privileged to offer with the extraordinary sustained support and enthusiastic support of HSBC. And I'll say more than a word in a moment about the importance of that relationship to us. But let me start by saying that the, the, the Council has, of course, long been committed to bringing issues in the global economy to our audiences here in Chicago. But we really upped the game, beginning, of course, in the fall of 2008, uh, with the onset of the financial crisis and then uh, the recession. In response to demand and interest from all of you, this series that we've done with HSBC over the ensuing three years has been the centerpiece of that entire effort. Uh, and it has been, I'm happy to say, a, in every, by every measure, a resounding success. Uh, the speakers in this series uh, reads like a, a who's who and global economic commentary, Paul Collier, Stephen Levitt, Cheng Li, Simon Johnson, Raghuram Rajan, Robert Reich, Jim Wolfenson, Axel Weber, and now Jillian Tett. And we have routinely drawn audiences like this, 400 to 500 people. So either you all have nothing else to do or you really want to hear what's going on in the economy. And I, a further test of your interest is uh, that we Played a trick on you, we started the event a half hour early in order to accommodate Ms. Tet's schedule and you still all showed up and filled the room. So the relationship with HSBC has been important because they have brought to us the interest and support for, these seri for this series, but also the bank's extraordinary history, the great esteem with which it is held around the world, my first acquaintance with HSBC, then I knew as Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation was in Hong Kong, as I was mentioning a moment ago to someone. And uh, it's a storied history, a great institution, and we've been privileged in the recent years to have HSBC much more active here in Chicago in the Midwest region. And that, that uh, in, Participation, that presence here has been led by Neil Booker. Neil, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. Um, Neil joined HSBC in 1981. He has had a, a wonderful career in the bank uh, uh, in, in a variety of, of locations and responsibilities in the developing markets and India, middle, the Middle East, and Thailand, and in the developed markets of, as well, the UK and the, and the US. Um, I, I learned, and to my great admiration, uh, that Neil, based on his years in India, is a genuine expert in expertise he has maintained on, on the Indian economy, and more generally on Indian life and society, a subject of, of great interest to me. He is a polymath. He is a, a Renaissance person. Um, but then that's sort of in his Scottish genes, I think. Um, he's a longtime friend of ours at the Council, and we've worked together not only on this project, but on others. Uh, Neil has himself been a speaker in several of our financial crisis and global economy programs. He is a valued member of the advisory committee for the Global Cities Index that the Chicago Council produces in association uh, with A.T. Carney. So all in all, this has been a, a, an astounding, an outstanding effort uh, 
uh, a partnership, a true partnership between ourselves and one of the leading financial and business institutions in the world uh, that we are privileged to have represented so well here in Chicago by Neil Booker. I want to express my personal and institutional thanks and admiration to Neil for all he's done to, to move us forward, to bring us to this point, to enable us to have uh, an audience and a speaker the likes of all of you tonight. And I ask you all now to join me in a hand of applause, round of applause for me. And now, Neil, come deliver your wit and wisdom. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Marshall, for that uh, very lengthy introduction. And uh, for your very kind words, uh, I appreciate them very much. And it's, as always, it's a great privilege to be back in Chicago. And uh, as Marshall said, this program has been, I hope, enormously successful for the council. Uh, for you that attend uh, so loyally and in such large numbers. But also, I'm pleased to say it's been enormously successful for us at HSBC. Um, you know, we uh, have had, haven't had our troubles to seek in the United States over the last few years, but being associated with this type of program, I think, has helped uh, bring our real brand uh, to the people of Chicago and uh, to enable people to understand what our group is really about. So I'd actually like to thank you, Marshall, uh, your colleagues, uh, Neve, and uh, all the other people that have worked on this program to get such uh, strong speakers for us, and of course, uh, to get such strong support from the people of Chicago. So thank you to the council, Marshall. Um, you know, tonight we're delighted to welcome Gillian Tett, as Marshall said, an accomplished financial journalist and author. Given her extensive experience covering the global financial markets, I'm looking forward to the frontline insights she will share with us tonight about the current crisis in the Eurozone and the options that may be available for resolving the situation. However, by the time she finishes speaking, a lot could have changed. So I wish her well with that particular, um, particular task. Europe is possibly facing the deepest economic crisis in the last half century. Indeed, Ms. Tett has warned readers recently in the Financial Times that the manner in which the Eurozone story is playing out feels unnervingly similar to the pattern behind the American financial turmoil of the late 2008. I hope she will not mind if I also mention a similar worrisome historical observation from another publication, The Economist, which recently noted that as little as three years ago, governments were credible backstops for their banks, and the Fed, the central bank at the heart of the crisis, was willing to do everything it could to create confidence. Now, the sovereigns are the problem, and the European Central Bank's help is limited, and it would appear very, very conditional. Indeed, the concern over the current European sovereign debt situation has led to tremendous market volatility, and governments are scrambling to find workable solutions. The meetings seem numerous, the solutions less so, unfortunately. The threat of recession on the continent is now very real. Even more daunting is the fact that there are legitimate concerns. The situation in Europe could become contagious and possibly derail the already fragile global economic recovery. Longer term, the overall competitiveness and paths to growth of the southern and peripheral European economies also need to be addressed. So whatever solutions are proposed in the short term, this longer term need may remain to be resolved. Ultimately, I'm optimistic the euro will survive. I might be in a minority, by the way. The consequences, but the consequences of it not doing so are even more dire, I fear, than the actions required to allow it to continue. Maybe that's not a very positive note on which to be confident, but I think that does summarize the situation. But I would say that the Eurozone crisis is not the, issue, not the only issue out there, and it would be a shame to blame all economic ills, particularly on this side of the pond, on the European situation. From my perspective, the European crisis is part of a trifecta of problems that we must wrestle with. 
The two other major issues are the degree of consumer deleveraging in the developed markets and the critical need in the US to address the twin challenges of the deficit and importantly the mortgage markets because housing represents such a big component of GDP here in the States. Gillian, I'm sure, will cover the European situation in detail. But what these three issues all have in common is a critical need now for political action and some courageous decision making. We may have used up much of the technical ammunition provided by central banks through monetary policy, etc. And the decisions which really could make a difference now reside in the political domain. At least one politician recognizes this. As Jean-Claude Juncker, the Prime Minister of Luxembourg, said recently, with, I hope, some sense of irony, we all know what to do, but we don't know how to get re-elected once we've done it. <laughs> In the case of consumer deleveraging, for example, people pull back and deleverage out of genuine fear and concern. The resulting lack of demand and investment could be solved by injecting more certainty about the future, especially around job security. A difficult mission to be sure, but whatever your political persuasion and whether you like your economic water salty or fresh, it seems hard to argue with this as an immediate policy objective. In terms of the ever increasing and crippling budget deficit, this can be addressed through effective tax reform and reductions in expenditure, although ultimately the unwinding of global imbalances will be important to hear too. This too requires political decision making, or as one French senator recently put it, on our side sovereign debts, on the other sovereign wealth funds. Finally, with housing responsible for about 80 basis points per year of negative contribution to GDP growth from 2006 to 2010, we must speedily clear the present mortgage crisis and implement, I think importantly, a new mortgage framework in the United States to bring stability to the housing market. This can be done through genuine leadership by the key stakeholders in government and the private sector, sharing the embedded losses, setting new standards for lending, revising risk tolerance by, for example, res restricting what I think will turn out to be one of the real, uh, uh, real bogeymen of the crisis, which was home equity withdrawal, and putting a pl in place a policy and regulatory framework that su supports sustainable mor mortgage activity. Going forward, there is a need for solid underwriting, which is not yet set down in the regulations published since the crisis. And this, in turn, may help build sufficient confidence in the product to restart securitization. Enough from me. Mrs. Tett has been covering these issues for a long time, and tonight I look forward to hearing her insights. Gillian Tett is the US managing editor and assistant editor of the Financial Times where she also oversees global coverage of the financial markets. She joined the paper in 1993 and worked in the former Soviet Union and Europe. In 1997, she was posted to Tokyo, where she became the bureau chief. In 2003, she became deputy head of the newspaper's Lex column, the oldest and arguably the most influential business and finance column of its kind in the world. She is the author of Fool's Gold, the inside story of JP Morgan, and how Wall Street greed corrupted its bold dream and created a financial catastrophe, which was awarded the Financial Book of the Year at the inaugural Spears Book Awards, and Saving the Sun, how Wall Street mavericks shook up Japan's financial system and made billions. In 2009, she was named Journalist of the Year at the British Press Awards, and she was named British Business Journalist of the Year in 2008. In 2007, she was awarded the Wincott Prize, the premier British award for financial journalism for her capital markets coverage. She received her MA and PhD from Cambridge University, my own alma mater. Her PhD is in social anthropology, a discipline she occasionally reverts back to in her columns, I noticed. I particularly commend a recent one, September the 9th, on the history of debt and the unequal power relationships debt creates. I quote, just as debtors in Mesopotamia used to end up as slaves, so too American subprime borrowers became, in effect, enslaved to the credit systems. Incidentally, in Mesopotamia, they used to periodically wipe the slate clean of debts. 
Are we working to do this in the mortgage space? I do actually believe this may be part of the solution, but if so, a whole new banking model may be required. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gillian Tapp. Well, thank you very much indeed, Neil, for that very kind introduction. And thank you very much indeed for inviting me along to speak to you tonight. Um, we at the Financial Times are deeply committed to covering America. America is actually our biggest audience, um, which still surprises some people. And we're very deeply committed to covering Chicago as well. And since we try and do that within a global framework, the fact I'm speaking tonight to the, global, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs is a wonderful combination of those two themes, I think. Now, I couldn't decide tonight when I arrived to talk about the Eurozone whether I had arrived at the worst of all times or the best of all times, because now more than ever, there is huge interest globally in what's happening in the Eurozone for reasons that are rather bad. Um, so it's great to see so many of you here tonight um, to talk about it. But at the same time, as Neil says, in some ways it's the worst of all times for me to be trying to make predictions for the future because as we speak, the leaders are gathered in Brussels. And just before I came up here, I checked on my um, BlackBerry to look at the FD site to see what we said had actually happened in the crucial summit talk tonight. And I see the headline says, shock horror, leaders struggle for Eurozone deal. <laughs> Frankly, there's a certain sense of deja vu about that, to put it mildly. So as Neil says, it could all have changed in the next hour. I somewhat doubt it. But in light of that, I'm going to step back tonight and try and take a big picture view. Um, you can ask me questions at the end about the minutiae of the latest talks. But what I want to do is talk about the Eurozone crisis, not just speaking as a financial journalist who has spent much of her career covering finance and economics, but also as an anthropologist. Because as Neil says, I have a very unusual background to be writing about finance from. I did a PhD in social anthropology in the former Soviet Union originally. And I have to admit that a few years ago when I went around Wall Street or the City of London and told people I had a PhD in social anthropology, um, most bankers used to look at me as if I was a bit mad. Um, it, those were the days when people tended to assume that to write about economics you needed a PhD in economics or failing that astrophysics or failing that an MBA. Numbers, numbers were, were what mattered. Quantitative debates were the really important debates, and things like anthropology tended to be regarded, as one banker once said to me, as all being rather hippie. <laughs> Back in the days when being a hippie was viewed as a bad thing. But if there's one thing we've learned in the last five years, is that finance and markets are not just about numbers. Social systems, the way people organize themselves, the things they think and believe matter enormously. And the question of faith and trust is absolutely central to markets and finance. Those of you who have a background in Latin will know that the roots of the word credit come from the word credere, meaning to believe. And what we have seen play out in the last five years is that finance without faith, credit markets, without credit in the original Latin sense of the word, simply do not work. And that lesson has been learnt in relation to the subprime crisis, the mortgage markets and banks. And I would argue it's very much at the core of what's going on today in the Eurozone. So what I want to do is to take a very brief detour to look back at how we've come to the Eurozone crisis, or rather the financial crisis, and then say a few words about how this issue of faith is playing out very immediately now in terms of where Europe is going, even tonight in Brussels. Now, I first started thinking about the issue of trust in finance 
a great deal about six years ago. When I was running the so-called capital markets team on the FT, and writing a lot about the credit markets, and in particular, about the issue of debt derivatives. And a bit closer, is that better? I'm sorry, is that better? Right. Um, so the first half of you will not, have not a heard word yet, but never mind. <laughs> I'm getting onto the meteor stuff now. Um, so I started first writing about, um, looking at the issue of trust about six years ago, when I was, um, working on the capital markets team at the FT, and looking a lot at the question of debt, derivatives, and the mortgage markets. And as I moved around looking at these newfangled securities and all these fast-growing areas of credit, one of the things that struck me very forcibly back then was that there was a tremendous amount of innovation going on in finance. There was a tremendous amount of complexity and there was a tremendous amount of new products that people were buying, creating, and trading. But back then, six, seven years ago, when I asked people as an ingenue to explain to me how the financial system worked, they often found it very hard. They could explain how little pieces of it worked, the immediate stuff that was in front of their noses. But if you asked them to explain how the entire credit system worked in this newfangled world, they often struggled. And it was clear to me back then that a lot of the way that finance worked before 2007 was very heavily reliant on faith, blind faith, if you like. There was a huge amount of faith in the way that models worked. People were very impressed, very dazzled by all the complexity around the models and all the rocket scientists. There was a lot of faith in the way that bankers worked. There was a fascinating cultural elision, if you like, which was that um, Pre-2007, a lot of people used to presume that if you were rich, you would, sorry, if you were smart, you would get rich. And so when people looked at bankers and saw that they were rich, they assumed, well, they must be very smart. And there was a lot of faith in regulators and a lot of faith in the power of innovation. In fact, the system in the world of finance often used to re remind me of something a bit like the medieval church in Europe where you had the congregation sitting in the aisles as the priests, the financial priests, conducted a service in Latin. And most people sitting in the aisles didn't understand the financial Latin, but they were pretty impressed by it. They assumed that if you spoke financial Latin, you must be very clever. They could see the blessings were flowing across the whole congregation in the form of cheap mortgages and lots of credit cards and things. And nobody really wanted to stand up and rock the boat and say, well, I don't really speak financial Latin. I don't understand how this financial system works, um, particularly since the entire system appeared to be blessed by the high pope himself, Alan Greenspan, and others who had said that the way that modern finance worked, modern financial innovation was good and was creating a better financial system. The system, as I say, was very much flying pre-2007 on faith. But if you look back at the way the financial crisis unfolded from the summer of 2007 onwards, one way to understand it is that essentially what happened was that one by one, the pillars of faith that had supported the system before 2007, if you like, had supported the blind faith in the system before 2007, steadily cracked. The first one to go was faith in the rating agencies and their wisdom in rating the mortgage-backed securities. Then faith in securitization started to crack. Faith in banks' balance sheets cracked as people realized that these wonderful models that everyone had believed in didn't actually work in terms of measuring the value of these securities. And if you couldn't measure the value of these securities, you couldn't actually work out what the value of the banks were and the assets they held on their balance sheets. Then faith in the regulators cracked as it became clear that the financial Latin didn't really work and that when regulators had said that the system was wonderfully safe, they hadn't really understood the system any better than the congregation that was sitting in the aisles. And for a while, at least, there was a, well, the trend towards a wider collapse was averted because certainly in late 2007 and early 2008, there was at least a vestige of faith that governments would step in and not let banks collapse. Um, all of you remember back to Bear Stearns when people saw the 
US government stepping in to avoid a full-blown collapse of Bear Stearns. In the aftermath of that, there was some belief that the government could be relied on to support the system that way. But then, when Lehman Brothers collapsed in the autumn of 2008, that smashed away the last pillar and tipped the credit markets for a period into a world where you had credit markets literally without credit, finance without faith. There was a period when essentially investors, bankers, regulators, journalists too, were operating in a terrifying landscape where it was very hard to find any kind of compass to make sense of what was going on. It was a fascinating period to observe as an anthropologist. All kinds of things happened to market psychology and the way that investors behaved. Time horizons collapsed inwards. People went from assuming that they could plan for 10 years to, assuming, to thinking that they were lucky if they could plan for 10 minutes. Faith in cyber finance and the ability to trade electronically suddenly collapsed and people wanted to only deal with people they knew. They went back to relationships. They went back to localized activity, not globalized activity, at least for a period as faith collapsed. But it was obviously sheer hell for many people who were actually experiencing that in the markets. And it was a very, very brutal shock to the system. So that was the world when faith collapsed in late 2008. And the story of 2009 and 2010, in many ways, has been the tale when the governments came to the rescue and managed to revive some element of faith in the system again by stepping in to replace the other pillars of faith that had propped the system up before 2007. I mean, I think most of you in the room are familiar with the contours of what the governments did in early 2009 and 2010, and I won't run through that again. Um, because we're going to talk about the Eurozone primarily. But essentially, they came in large scale, propped the system up, provided a new form of trust, and enabled finance to begin to heal itself, particularly in America. The problem, though, is that, as most of you will, in the audience will know from your everyday lives, trust, once broken, is very hard to restore. And once investors have gone from a world of complacency, a world of the great moderation, a world where things seem to be stable, into a world where, at least for a brief terrifying moment, they experienced credit markets without credit. Once they've experienced that shock, it's very hard to forget. And although the healing that we've seen in 2009 and 2010 to a degree appeared to be working, What's happened in Europe has reopened re those wounds, rekindled that sense of fear in a very dramatic way. Because what we're seeing out play out in Europe today, in some ways, is the next natural step in that progressive loss of faith that we've seen or experienced since 2007. Having seen investors lose faith, first in rating agencies and securitization, then in banks, and then regulators. What we're starting to see play out in Europe now is investors ask whether they can actually have faith in central banks and governments anymore. Can they trust the governments that came in to act as a pillar of faith back in 2009 or 2010? Or are we going to move into a new world where credit markets lose the very last vestige of credit and trust that has been propping them up for the last two or three years? Now, this question in Europe first started to surface in relation to not so much the governments, but the banks. And as many of you will know, back in 2009, when the US banks were forced under pressure from the US government to engage in a pretty wholesale cleansing um, of their assets, or at least come clean about their balance sheets with the stress tests, there were always a large number of questions being asked back then about whether the Eurozone governments, sorry, Eurozone banks had come clean as well. I remember very clearly having a series of conversations with people from the IMF and other parts of the US government back then about what the European banks were doing. And there was a widespread cynicism, some of which has been reflected in public statements about whether or not the Eurozone banks were coming clean. But for a, certain, um, for a certain period, at least, people were willing to, to spend 
their concerns because there was a feeling that, well, these Eurozone banks are supported by Eurozone governments and eventually they will amortize their losses. Eventually they will be able to reveal them bit by bit without shocking the market. And so maybe if we can start to spark that broader financial sector healing, which appeared to be on the cars back in 2009, maybe it won't matter so much. But really starting about 18 months ago, concerns about the Eurozone banking system began to become a lot more severe. That was partly because of a wider concern about the economic outlook, but it's also because of the concern about the Eurozone credit and sovereign credit situation and about where the Eurozone was going more generally. Because if you look at the Eurozone and the way that, that it's played out in the last few years, in many ways, you can see a similar pattern in terms of blind faith and trust, as you saw in the US mortgage markets and the securitization world before 2007. What do I mean by that? Well, essentially, I happened to be working on the economics team in London back in 1996-97, at the very early stages of the creation of the Eurozone project. And I remember way back then writing a number of articles pointing out that the only way the Eurozone was ever going to work, the only way that a single currency could ever operate across the European region, would be if the different members each adhered to a strict set of fiscal and economic rules and essentially either had their economies converge or had their mechanisms in place to ensure that they could adjust and adapt to changing economic fortunes. It was taken as a given that if you didn't have some way to have serious fiscal transfer, you had to have sufficient flexibility in terms of wages or at least a labor movement to actually get some kind of single currency union to work, and you had to have everyone playing roughly by the same rules. And certainly back then, it seemed very clear to anybody who was writing about the Eurozone that countries like Greece, um, Portugal, would struggle to meet many of the original Eurozone rules. And it was also very clear that if push ever came to shove and there wasn't a sufficient level of convergence, it would be extremely painful to actually impose a type of wage flexibility that economic models would demand, and it would also be pretty unlikely that you'd see the level of labor market flexibility across borders of the sort that you've seen, say, in the US to ensure that you had a single currency system work effectively. So even before the Eurozone project was launched, there was quite a degree of, if you like, cynicism or skepticism amongst those who were looking at it about what would it would take to make the Eurozone project work. And perhaps more importantly, there was a lot of skepticism and cynicism um, amongst the financial journalist community before 1999 in terms of what, whether or not the countries that were trying to meet the Maastricht targets were actually managing to do so. It was an open secret that countries like Italy were using all kinds of creative measures to fudge their numbers. It was a pretty open secret that Greece could not always be relied on in terms of its statistics. And there was a lot of cynicism about some of the tricks that were being used in the markets. Perhaps more importantly still, once the Eurozone actually started, it was again very clear for anyone who looked closely at the evidence that convergence was not really occurring, at least in concrete economic terms. I mean, just one small example that um, was recently drawn to my attention. If you look at what's happened to Germany over the last decade, its productivity has risen by about 9.4%, and the German economy as a whole has grown by about 10%. If you look at Italy, its productivity has not risen at all, and the economy has only expanded at a very moderate pace. And yet, just as in the subprime market, just as in the mortgage market pre-2007, for a very long time, there was a, a tremendous suspension of disbelief a tremendous ability on the part of investors and governments alike to ignore these tangible realities and to somehow assume that they didn't matter so much, to somehow trust and have faith that the system could work. There was blind faith, if you like, in the idea that never mind what the mechanics on the ground of the project might be, that somehow things would just work out fine. <laughs> 
people didn't want to look too closely at the, sorry, people didn't want to look too closely at what actually lay behind the innards of the Eurozone. The same kind of alchemy that made investors ignore that it was very strange to take subprime mortgages, junk mortgages, and turn them into AAA bonds. It also enabled the Eurozone bond markets to have very similar yields for German debt as Greek debt for a very long time. But the key thing that's happened in the last 18 months is that that blind faith, that confidence, that trust in alchemy has started to crack. And as it started to crack, that has not merely dragged down individual countries, it's began to drag down the entire Eurozone project. And at the same time, it started to drag down the Eurozone banks too. One of the very important things that um, I think many Americans have failed to realize is the degree to which the Eurozone banking system and the sovereign debt is tightly entwined. Some 80% of Eurozone public and private debt is held by the banks. The banking system in Europe is significantly larger than that in the US. And as a result, as faith in the banks have started to crack, as people have become concerned about whether or not they can actually, they've come clean about their assets, faith in governments have started to crumble as well as people began to fear that they would have to step in to support the banks. And as faith in the sovereigns have started to crumble, the faith in the banks have begun to crack as well because of concern about the type of sovereign debt that they hold on their balance sheets. They're very, very entwined in a potentially very, very dangerous way. And perhaps more importantly still, as faith in the Eurozone country's ability to repay their debts has started to crack, that has caused something of a profound existential shock for many of the investors in Europe who are holding that sovereign debt as well. One of the very pernicious things that's happened psychologically is that many of the investors who have traditionally bought Eurozone sovereign debt have come from a background where they've um, essentially treated sovereign debt as rates trading. They've assumed that they, when they bought that kind of debt, they needed to look at the interest rate. They have not generally not thought too hard about the credit quality of sovereign debt because traditionally everyone assumed that these countries had converged that essentially most of them were AAA rated, or if they weren't AAA rated, they were part of the Eurozone, and so you didn't need to worry about whether or not those countries would actually repay their debts. However, as the markets have begun to lose faith in the idea that these countries would always repay their debts, as they've begun to lose faith in whether or not the Eurozone itself would hang together permanently, investors have suddenly been tipped into a shocking new world where they're having to look at credit quality attached to Eurozone governments for pretty much the first time. It's the same kind of psychological shock that many investors felt in the US when the AAA rated subprime mortgages or the bundles of AAA subprime mortgages, the CDOs that they held, and again, which they had generally not used credit analysis to look at, suddenly began to become impaired and suddenly began to require credit analysis for the first time. And for the most part, the investors holding Eurozone bonds, precisely because they've not been trained in a credit analysis kind of framework, have found it very hard, psychologically very disorientating, to move to a world where suddenly they have to try and grade these different classes of Eurozone bonds. If you look at the different Eurozone bonds today, I mean, you can simply see the range or the degree to which faith in the project has cracked, because you go from something like um, Germany, which is currently trading at 102 cents or euro cents in the dollar, um, to or 102 percent, to Italy 93, um, Ireland around 80, Portugal 57, and Greece is currently at around 40 percent of face value. So the sense of hanging together has fallen apart very dramatically. The alchemy has collapsed. Now, as faith in the Eurozone project has crumbled, um, logic would suggest that there are really two ways that the Eurozone governments can deal with this. Um, one way to deal with it would be to essentially say, OK, game over. Um, if we no longer believe that the countries have converged su sufficiently to actually operate within a monetary system or a single monetary system, we should kick the countries that don't conform out. And there have been plenty of people who have been essentially predicting that and suggesting that either the Eurozone splits in two 
or you simply remove some of the weaker members, or perhaps even more controversially, you remove Germany and one or two of the stronger members and let the weaker members hang together as a single Latin union of sorts. The alternative way to deal with that would be to, would be to say, well, actually, instead of kicking out the weaker members or splitting apart, you move to what is essentially an American, US type model of, fiscal, of monetary union and have a much, much stronger fiscal center and essentially create a single Eurozone treasury with the ability to not only issue Eurozone bonds that would essentially knit the different countries together in terms of their joint funding, um, but also have the ability to make fiscal transfers across borders. So those are essentially the two key choices which have been confronting the Eurozone leaders ever since faith in the project began to crack, ever since the alchemy began to fail. Both of those options are extremely unpalatable to most of the Eurozone leaders. So unpalatable, in fact, that one way to make sense of what's happened of the last year, one reason why the FT has had constant headlines saying Eurozone leaders struggle to reach a decision, is that essentially what the Eurozone leaders have been doing is trying to kick the can down the road and avoid having to choose between either of those two options. Behind that tactic of kicking the can down the road, there has been very much a feeling on the part of some Eurozone leaders that maybe, just maybe, playing for delay would actually make sense. Um, one reason why some Eurozone leaders thought that it could make sense to kick the can down the road and wait was that they thought, well, maybe if the economy starts to grow, maybe if the outlook begins to improve, maybe if that financial sector healing gathers pace, then the debt problems won't look quite so serious. Another rather forlorn hope that has very much affected their strategy has been a, a hope on the part of some of them that perhaps if they played for time, the sense of political consensus would emerge across the continent that as since so much of Europe is driven by this search for consensus and this need to act in, act in concert, there was a feeling that perhaps people would adjust their expectations and that people would naturally come together and forge a single path. The problem, if you like, is that both of those hopes have proven to be, proven to be absolutely wrong. Not only has the economic outlook got worse, not better, to the point where the Eurozone is now hovering on the edge of a recession, but the sense of political consensus has not emerged. On the contrary, political divisions have become more and more significant. And you can see that at the highest level in the sense that much of the wrangling that's occurring now in Brussels and the other capitals is becoming more and more intense. There are very significant differences of views between France, Germany, there's even more significant difference of views between Italy and Germany and several of the other capitals. But also at the grassroots, the sense of political fracture amongst the electorate and the sense of distrust and downright anger and protest amongst the electorate has become more significant. And that, in turn, has made it extremely hard for the Eurozone leaders to try and essentially do what much of the American um, establishment have been urging them to do for some time, which is to pull together and actually find a solution to this loss of faith and trust in the project. I was um, down in Naples um, in the last couple of days at a conference organized by the CME where George W. Bush was speaking. And he was recalling at one point the events of late 2008 um, when Hank Paulson famously declared that he wanted to have a bazooka in the form of the TARP program to fight the loss of confidence, the loss of faith in the US banking system. And essentially what Hank Paulson got in the form of his bazooka was an agreement from Congress that he could have a $700 billion fund with which to prop up the US banking system. That much is widely known. What is perhaps more remarkable is the fact that once, once Treasury um, Secretary Paulson got that fund, he was essentially given an extraordinary amount of freedom and leeway in terms of how, deciding how to um, use that fund. 
I mean, former President Bush tells the stories about at one stage, you know, Paulson and the Treasury team went to see him and said, right, we plan to do this with our fund. Um, originally, as many of you will know, they planned to buy bad assets from the US banks with their fund. And then after a bit of debate, they went back again and said to President Bush, well, actually, we've changed our mind. We don't think that's going to work. We're going to try something else. Um, the way that President Bush tells a story, he says, well, you know, his, he said, well, okay, if you've changed your mind, you go ahead and do it. You do whatever you want. But the, well, not quite whatever you want, but, you know, I'm going to take, take it on advice. Whatever, you know, you are the advisors, you know, you're the experts. You decide how you're going to use it. Just make sure you find something to do with that bazooka that is going to restore faith in the system. And effectively, what Paulson and the Treasury team, backed up by the Fed, then went out and did was pretty dramatic in terms of forcing the banks to accept capital injections and was pretty effective, particularly because it was then backed up by a stress test. Now, American officials have been urging the Europeans to do a similar kind of bazooka-like um, maneuver and to do something decisive to actually prop up faith in the Eurozone system. The problem, though, is that if you look back to what happened in the US in the autumn of 2008 and hear the stories about how decisions, how decisions were made and how people were actually firing that bazooka, the thing that's very striking is that you had a very small group of people who were actually pulling the trigger on that bazooka, who were actually pointing that bazooka, and they were able to act with considerable speed. It was a small, tight team who were making the decisions, and they were able to be very forceful. The problem in the European situation, of course, is that not only do they not have a dramatic bazooka, in the sense that although the 440 billion that people are talking about with the Europe EFSF um, sounds dramatic on paper, it's not as big as the markets are looking for, but not only do they not have the large-scale bazooka thus far, but they don't have the ability to point it and aim it quickly and speedily because there's not one single group of people with their fingers on the trigger. You have 17 national parliaments that are each trying to point it in different directions and 17 different parliaments, many of which are now demanding the ability to veto, to approve, to debate any attempt to actually load that bazooka and aim it. Um, just in the last couple of days, um, we've had stories in the FT about the fact that Bundestag in Germany, to cite but one example, is now demanding the right to discuss and debate any decision that Angela Merkel makes in relation to the Eurozone um, fund. And that kind of thing not merely makes it that much more complex in terms of trying to take decisions, it also slows down any ability to react and actually have a decisive um, solution. Now, in theory, there are some people who could break through that. Um, the European Central Bank is one of the institutions that perhaps does have, on paper at least, the ability to make decisions swift, swiftly and forcefully and to actually act. I mean, the European Central Bank, of course, has a governing council with different views, but they are, to a degree, tight-lipped, or at least tight-lipped compared to most of the Eurozone parliaments, which are anything but tight-lipped. Um, and they do also have the ability to make decisions and actually act on them. And some of you may have seen in today's Financial Times an excellent piece by Martin Wolf, which essentially is a letter to, to Mario Draghi, the incoming head of the ECB, imploring him to use the powers vested in the ECB to shore up the system by buying or rather underwriting or supporting um, Eurozone bonds to a very large degree. Martin believes that the ECB is now the only institution that could really act forcefully and speedily, um, and therefore it is beholden on Mario Draghi as he comes in to do that, um, essentially to do whatever it takes. He is the only one that really has an effective bazooka now. The problem, though, of course, is that Mario Draghi is coming in as the new head of the ECB. He comes from Italy. Um, he is precisely because he comes from Italy, um, quite understandably very reluctant to be seen to be going soft. Um, 
Some people think inside the Eurozone system that actually it should have been Jean-Claude Trichet who took that kind of dramatic step as his last parting shot as he leaves the ECB. But again, for reasons of his legacy, it seems as if um, Jean-Claude Trichet is reluctant to do that. But if he's reluctant to do that, it's that much harder for someone like Mario Draghi coming in to take that kind of radical step without immediately alienating the Germans. Of course, in theory, again, the Germans, as the largest paymasters of the Euro system, Eurozone system, the one country that has enough financial and fiscal flexibility to really be bold at the moment, they perhaps are the other people who could step in now and act forcefully and pull that bazooka. And yet, inside Germany, there is an intense political debate going on right now about the degree to which the German public will or will not support any attempt to prop up the rest of the Eurozone system. And partly for reasons of history, the German leadership currently appears to be extremely reluctant to do anything like create a bazooka by itself, let alone actually fire it. Time and again, the pattern has been that the Eurozone leadership only acts when there's a crisis and then only acts slowly in such a manner that it tends to create yet another crisis. So, as I said, we're back to a situation where the Eurozone leaders are meeting in Brussels tonight and struggling to come up with some kind of deal. There are all kinds of um, ideas and options being put on the table at the moment. I mean, as many of you will know, the original EFSF fund that was supposedly earmarked to try and support the system has been set um, as at 440 billion euros Trying to expand that raw money on the table right now would be very hard to do quickly because that would involve the ratification by 17 parliaments or at least the approval by 17 parliaments. And in a sense, <clears throat> that would slow down the process once again. So the Eurozone leaders are looking for more fudges. They're talking about ways of trying to leverage that fund. They're talking about ways of tapping some of the non-European countries, either via the IMF um, or through other special purpose vehicles to bring more money from outside in to support that fund. People are talking about trying to find ways of insuring Eurozone bonds, essentially, say, underwriting the first 20% of any loss on Eurozone bonds, in particular Italian bonds, to stabilize the system and to provide more support for the sovereign debt markets across the Eurozone. And at the same time, they're also talking about trying to recapitalize the banks, and amid all that, trying to find some kind of restructuring deal for Greece. At the moment, about the only part of the deal which is currently um, agreed upon, it seems, is that people want the Eurozone banks to have at least 9% tier one capital going forward, although no one's quite decided how they're going to do that. Um, and there's also a clear-cut deal now that um, the Greek bondholders will have to take more than 21% haircuts that were originally agreed, people are talking perhaps more like 50 to 60%. But the reality is, as of today, as of right now, there isn't a clear-cut deal on the table. There's still a lot of confusion, there's a lot of uncertainty, and above all else, there's now a lot of distrust on the part of the markets. So, taken together, it's very, very dangerous territory indeed. As I said at the beginning, so much of the Eurozone system has been flying on blind faith as the mortgage market before 2007. So much has essentially depended on investor trust in a time of alchemy that doesn't really stand up to close scrutiny. We've seen what happens in the world of mortgage-backed securities and securitization and banks when that trust begins to unravel we're starting to see what could happen if it begins to unravel in the case of the Eurozone governments. And what perhaps makes the current situation doubly deadly is that even as the Eurozone governments play for time, we're living in a world where collapse of trust, where bad news, where cynicism can spread faster and faster than ever before. I spent um, part of the last couple of days down at, in Naples with the CME, um, talking with Biz Stone and Ariana Huffington about the way that the modern media is operating and the way that some of the technological changes um, in our era are affecting financial markets and the business climate. And we had a very lively discussion with them about the question of whether or not 
tools like Twitter, tools like Facebook, were actually exacerbating turbulence and contributing to social upheaval and financial upheaval, or simply speeding up the cycle. People like Biz Stone, one of the co-founders of Twitter, would argue that social media and electronic tools are simply accelerating cycles, and that where people might have protested slowly in the past, these days the protests erupt very quickly. If you look at things like the Arab Spring, he would argue that essentially what you've seen is simply a speeding up of the protest, not the creation of protest altogether. You can argue that point for a long time. But the one thing that is clear is that, as I said, trust, once it's shattered, is very, very hard to restore. And trust in a world where information can flash back and forth between Brussels and Chicago, between London and Shanghai, in the blink of a moment, is doubly hard to restore. The Eurozone leaders are playing with fire right now. I hope, pray, they find a way to restore that trust. But if not, I fear and suspect that we could be heading for a replay where credit markets lose credit to the cost of us all. So I'll stop there on a slightly gloomy note. And very happy to take questions on that or any other related themes. Um, and thank you all for listening. So we just have a couple of moments uh, for questions. Yeah, right up the front here, Barrett McLean, please. Jillian, thank you so much for such a wonderfully comprehensive overview. Um, I know we're probably still on the record, but nonetheless, don't you think a lot of the problems in the Eurozone are because of different cultures, different uh, priorities? There's a dissonance there that has never been quite acknowledged, uh, which is... Um, creating quite a problem financially as well as culturally? Um, I think that is absolutely part of the problem. Um, but one of the fascinating things about the Eurozone, which um, Jean-Claude Trichet is very fond of pointing out, um, is that if you look at the difference between unemployment rates and GDP rates between different Eurozone countries, there's actually less disparity across the Eurozone than there is across the United States. Um, it's really quite remarkable. If you were to look at the Eurozone as an entire single economic block and look at its rate of debt to GDP, again, it's less than many other parts of the Western world as a block. So in theory, if the Eurozone could ever get its act together and act as a single coordinated unit, um, it should be able to overcome its problems quite easily. In practice, the problem is that there is a vast array of different cultures and different systems that prevent people from moving across borders. Um, there's also, though, a sense of, I would argue, distrust between the populations, the electorate, and their leaders about the merits of the Eurozone project altogether. And one of the things that strikes me very forcibly is that, you know, if you go out and talk to ordinary people in many parts of the Eurozone about whether or not they think the Eurozone is a good idea, you know, they'll say grudgingly, well, you know, yes. Um, but if you go and talk to many of the elites who actually run countries like Germany and France and Belgium, you know, do they think the Eurozone is a good idea? Many of them are very deeply committed to the project because for them it's been born out of the Second World War and it's about creating a peaceful Europe. So in the, amongst the elites, there's a very strong sense of commitment, or there has been until now, but there has been a gap between that vision in Brussels and Frankfurt and ordinary um, voters. And that's one of the reasons why the current situation is so fraught and why that, those, those fissures, I think, are opening up more and more at the moment. I think that's partly yes. Okay, next question, please. Yeah, the lady in the second row in the back, please. One second, please wait for the mic. What is your definition of trust? 
bit like that old thing about, you know, you know well, pornography when you see it kind of thing. Um, the, um, the, I mean, a lack of trust is basically, I mean, trust essentially is believing that a system will work and having faith that you can leave money with a bank, having faith that a government will repay its bonds to you, having faith that you can give your money to a government, and having faith that the system will work, essentially. And I think that you know, during the era of the great, what I like to call the great moderation, what, also what economists used to call the great moderation, what I sometimes call the great complacency, um, you know, the decade or so before 2007, um, many people came to trust systems very deeply, implicitly, to a point where they really question, rarely questioned the foundations of that. Um, but people just kind of trusted that they could plan for the future, that systems would always work, um, that governments would be there. And that, I think, has been un undermined. Um, next question over here, please. Um, Jordan Shields. <coughs> This piggybacks a little bit off the first question, um, but a lot is, we're seeing a lot about what's happening on the street in Greece. We're seeing Berlusconi say he can't do anything because of what's going on with the Northern League. Uh, we're seeing the politics in the countries that are under significant distress. Building off your answer earlier, uh, what sort of what's holding back Angela Merkel and the other leaders who are very committed to the Eurozone from taking action? Um, well, I think um, one of the really important things that people need to look at now when they're trying to make sense of the system or situation is another concept that generally got ignored in economics in recent years, which is the question of social cohesion and the question of what is it about societies that enables them to stick together when times are tough and take tough decisions and actually implement them and what prevents them from splintering or what causes some of them to fall apart. And the social co cohesion question is playing out very differently in different countries. Um, somewhere like Ireland, which is where I have a lot of my family, um, has exhibited a surprisingly high level of social cohesion, I would argue, in the last few years. And although Ireland has, has and is going through very tough times, it's quite striking the degree to which there is still a sense of people pulling together in Ireland, at least. Um, other parts of the Eurozone don't have that. I mean, Italy's sense of social cohesion across the entire I Italian nation, I think, is much more fragile. The problem in Germany right now is a very um, big clash between an older generation that is very much driven by the memories of the Second World War and a need, a sense of commitment to trying to ensure that Europe hangs together. Um, a younger generation that increasingly doesn't feel that same sense of obligation and a real tension between the commitment of the Germans to upholding Teutonic values of sobriety and saving and hard work with a realization that p most of the rest of Europe does not hold to those same values. And the Germans went into the Eurozone project kind of assuming that every everybody else would become more German. <laughs> and it didn't happen. And there, therein lies the essential, essential tension. Well, we have a student group in the back from lab school. Do we have any questions from the student group? Yeah, thanks. You mentioned that the, the leading cause of the whole situation is the loss of trust. Have such issues of lost trust and faith, uh, and lost faith, leading to such global and um, really bad situations in the world? Have then have there been examples in history? Can we can we refer, refer to um, history? to solve this problem? Um, well, there have been examples when currency unions have fallen apart before. I mean, the Latin monetary union is one example. Um, I, myself, have, have lived through one experience in the former Soviet Union, where you know, I've seen what happens when people lose faith in the value of money, um, and when currency unions fall apart there. I mean, very different circumstances. 
Anybody who's lived through emerging market crises have seen what happens when faith in money and banks and government starts to collapse. And one of the really fascinating things that's going on right now is that um, people who have experience in restructuring emerging market debt, people who've lived through the Argentinian crises are now in hot demand on the trading desks in London, um, not so much in terms of analyzing emerging market debt, but using their skills to try and make sense of, say, Greece. And there's a real sense of having to learn from the emerging market world when it comes to understanding what's happening in the developed world at the moment. I mean, <clears throat> the, even these very labels of emerging market and developed are beginning to look increasingly outdated. And above all else, the idea that emerging market debt was where you looked at political risk and developed market debt was where you just looked at the economic fundamentals is also looking more and more outdated. So there's plenty of examples of loss of faith in individ and trust in individual countries. What is perhaps scary about the situation right now in Eurozone is that, and as the Economist article that Niels referred to earlier pointed out, when people lose faith in banks, governments can step in to prop up the banking system. The question right now is what happens when people lose faith in governments. We have time for one more short question. You have the gentleman right here in the white shirt. Gillian, fascinating conversation. Um, in, a, in an era of no faith and trust, there's an opportunity for heroes to emerge. Do you see any heroes emerging out of the Eurozone? Heroes in Eurozone, goodness me. Um, I would love to see some heroes in the Eurozone. I mean, you know, I would have loved to have written a script where Jean-Claude Trichet leaves the Eurozone at the end of this month and as his final parting shot does something truly dramatic. I would love to see a, you know, script where Mario Draghi comes in and does something. I don't see many people right now who have the ability to actually act, not because of a lack of character, but because the structure of the system makes it so hard to act. You know, and time and again, I go back to that bazooka problem that, you know, whether or not you think that Hank Paulson, Tim Geithner um, and co. were heroes back in 2008, they were able to actually get that bazooka and fire it um, with considerable freedom, um, or rather Ben Bernanke. You know, right now, it's very, very hard for anyone in the Eurozone to actually do that. And I just leave with one last comment which came from a very senior Eurozone policymaker or former Eurozone policymaker who was German. He said to me that the real tragedy of the Eurozone today was its inability or the, for the Germans to think about the Marshall Plan. Because after the Second World War, Germany benefited enormously from the fact that the Americans and other allied powers created a Marshall Plan for reconstruction, which wasn't going to bring any immediate payback to America, but kind of felt like the right thing to do. And in the long term, brought about enormous payback for everybody by allowing the reconstruction to take place. And in some ways, this person was saying, what's desperately needed today in, Euro in the Eurozone is for the Germans to create their own new Marshall Plan for Greece and the rest of the Eurozone. And for somebody to just go to the German public and say, now is a moment to pass on the historical baton. But the problem is that thus far at least, nobody has managed to articulate that vision. And sadly, it may not come about until it's too late. Political correctness. Well. So, well, so, uh, apologies for ending on a gloomy note. <laughs> Uh, everyone, Gillian, I'd like to thank you very much for coming up and giving us a different, perhaps, perspective than what we're used to seeing uh, on our Bloomberg screens and Reuters screens during the day. Perhaps every organization should adopt an anthropologist. And, uh, you know, those, those of you who watch Bones on the television may see what benefit that has been to the FBI. So maybe the banks and certainly some of the regulators could perhaps benefit from uh, a much wider perspective of what's been going on uh, in the world. I'm less pessimistic than Gillian, I have to say, because, you know, 
I'm actually a historian as well as a lawyer. And looking back over periods of history, there have been enormous periods of turbulence in banking uh, and in sovereigns all over the world. And interestingly, Gillian drew allusion to the, uh, the medieval church, but the church has survived in many guises uh, today and still exists. It's metamorphosed uh, a number of times, but I'm still hopeful that we will get through the crisis in Europe, uh, but it will require, to the question on heroes, it will require somebody to step up to the plate. And I think it's going to require somebody uh, to reflect on uh, what Jean-Claude Juncker said and consider that actually getting re-elected after making these decisions may not be the most important thing. Uh, making the decisions in the political domain will be. So Gillian, thanks very much. I know you've got a busy schedule. Um, I really appreciate it. On behalf of everyone, as usual, thank you to the council, to Marshall, to Neve, and to my colleagues from HSBC that helped put this together. So thank you all for coming. Safe journey home. And I know the council looks forward to seeing you at future events. Thank you. <laughs>